Floral morphology is the study of the shape and structure of flowers. And this unit will take a look at flowers, starting with the ethnobotanical view on flowers. Flowers for humans have uses and meanings and functions. And then we'll take a look at the structure of flowers, because it is the structure of flowers that allows us to categorize which flowers belong together. It was by flower types that plants were first sorted out by people such as Linnaeus and others who worked on the earliest botanies. If the flowers looked the same, then the plants were considered to be related plants. Flowers are often used by restaurants, hotels, and other businesses. They add a touch of elegance to a place. Flowers are also a part of our celebrations, celebrating goals achieved, celebrating graduation, and other important life events, such as getting married. No wedding would be complete without a bouquet of flowers, or more than one bouquet of flowers. They celebrate a new relationship, a new life together. There are many meanings embedded in the flowers. Flowers are often woven into lays and garlands and other decor. These are Ixora flowers. Here we see an orchid woven into this particular, along with some hibiscus. And flowers are often used in our clothing, such as these Pompeian skirts. Flowers are also a part of our way of mourning, the loss of a loved one, someone dear to us. So flowers are with us from the beginning of a relationship, and a couple gets married. They're often part of the way we say goodbye to somebody at the end of life. Functionally, plants are part of the system that a plant uses to reproduce the way a plant makes more plants. And flowers are usually evolved to attract a particular pollinator, usually a, an animal of some sort, animal, insect, could be a bird, and the that bird or animal or insect carries the pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of a flower and allows the flower to reproduce. So there is a deep connection between flowers and reproduction. And flowers are designed to attract pollinators. So there is perhaps little surprise that flowers are also used therefore as a mark of beauty and to attract, even for Homo sapiens. The flower bud contains four nested layers that are referred to as whorls. These four layers each have names, and they unfurl to form the four basic parts of the plant. The outermost part of the bud is photosynthetic and green. That part is known as the calyx. The sepals are the individual elements in the calyx. And the sepals, along with the calyx they're a part of, are the outermost whorl, the first whorl in a flower. Not all flowers have sepals. In fact, many do not have sepals. So some flowers are referred to as being incomplete flowers, as they may be missing one of these parts. The next layer in are the petals. That layer is called the corolla. That's the name of the layer. The petals are the individual elements in the corolla. Again, there are flowers that do not have petals. Some do, some do not. The next element inside is the male element, the androecium. The long, thin parts are the filaments, and the anthers at the top contain the pollen. So the pollen is the male gametes of the flower, the male parts that are often carried by animals to other flowers. The gynoecium houses the 
what I thought of as the female elements of the flower. Again, plants aren't people. They aren't men and women. But we think of these as female parts. The ovary, the style, the stigma are part of the pistil, and they're all part of the gynoecium. The stigma is at the very top of that style. The style is a stalk, and on top of it, the little double round uh, element is the stigma. The pollen attaches to the stigma and then tunnels through the style to the ovary where the eggs are to form a seed for a new plant. This is a hibiscus flower. You can see it has a corolla with five petals. The yellow parts are the anthers there. They're actually attached to the outside of the style and the red part on the right, that's the stigma. It's five-headed. Hibiscus is a dicot. That means when the seed sprouts, there are two baby leaves that come out. Here's another hibiscus. Most dicots have four petals or five petals or a multiple of four or five. This is Hibiscus teleaceus, five petals. Look closely, you'll see this plant too has five petals. It too is a dicot. This is Ixora. Ixora has four petals. Four or five petals is typical of a dicot. Here we see a papaya flower, five petals. And these are the fused petals of a morning glory. This is an Ipomea. This is Ipomea littoralis. Five petals fused together, uh, but still five petals. And so it is indeed a dicot. This is Melastoma malabathricum. Again, the five petals indicates that it is a dicot, and the leaves too tell you that. Here's a plant sometimes referred to as Spanish shawl. It's a related plant, also having five petals. Here's night blooming jasmine. Uh, it too has five. This is uh, Scavola tacata. You'll see it has five petals, but they're a little bit off to one side. It's a half flower, a fan flower as it's called but it is still a five-petaled dicot. It just has an asymmetric flower. Here's another asymmetric five-petaled flower, although you have to look close to see all five. This is a five-petaled magnolia. Also, you have to look closely to see all five. This is five-petaled Fulcomeria nermis, known as Elau on Pompeii. Lantana actually has four fused petals. It too is a dicot with four fused petals. Here we see a plant with eight petals, a multiple of four. Uh, and this too, often eight-petaled plant, is a jasmine plant. Sometimes be seen as uh, eight petals. Now there are plants that don't have a multiple of four or five, such as this gardenia titensis. It often has seven petals and, confusingly enough, sometimes has six petals. Six petals is usually a sign of a monocot, but Gardenia titensis sometimes produces a six-petal flower. This is the flower of the coffee plant. Not all dicots will really clearly have a countable number of petals. Some of them will be somewhat confusing, and this will be true, too, for the monocots. Here we see Senna alata, a plant known as Chugan Kilinwai on Pompeii, Shakito over on Koshrai, Arakak over in Chuk. This is a daisy family member, a member of the daisies, a Compositae or Asteraceae. You'll hear it referred to both ways in, by botanists. This, too, is. These are dicots, and these are rather complicated I'm not going to go into them. Those heads are actually made of many, many flowers, and each petal is a flower. I'm going to turn attention now to the monocots. Monocots have petals in multiples of three. Three petals, six petals, or more. Here we see a rain lily, a Zephyranthes plant, and it has six petals along with six anthers, and you'll even see that the stigma is three parts. I'll wrap up the video with some photographs of some more unusual monocots. One can't always determine whether a plant is a monocot or dicot just by counting the petals. Orchids will mislead you. It might look like this Philippine ground orchid or this uh, Micronesian ground orchid, Spathoglottis micronesica, have five petals, 
but uh, there's actually a sixth petal there. But this is just meant to be a bit of an introduction to flowers. Flowers have meaning, flowers have uses, flowers have functions, and it is their structure and their morphology that allows us to characterize the uh, flowers and to help sort plants into some of the different families that we put plants into.